again. Yeah. Great, thanks. And then everybody's comfortable sitting all the way in the back? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. I want to sit here in the front. Everybody, uh, thanks for coming. This is our second meetup as we're leading up over the next year to the May 2013 Boise Maker Fair. And the, the meetups are these impromptu or less formal ways of getting together to share ideas and for us to bring topics to uh, Boise area members. And this is a place, I'm going to try to read script, maybe go a little bit off script, but um, our meetups are really intended to be gathering places for innovators, uh, for inventors, for folks that do custom stuff. And now, when you think about it, our definition of makers is so broad that just about everybody qualifies as a maker in some way. But um, we really want to focus in the meetups on both uh, sharing ideas and looking on education, looking at education. And I want to, how many folks here are familiar with the actual maker fairs? So a couple. How many people have actually been to a maker fair? Awesome. Which one did you go to? Uh, San Mateo last year. Awesome. Yeah, well, I loved it like, twice. Let me tell you. San Mateo. Come on. San Mateo. You guys go together? Carpool? No? You didn't even know each other? No. No. no, no you know each other. But we had some things too. <laughs> and, um, and it's actually been, it's been billed as what they call the world's largest show and tell on Earth. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that is the key place. I had never seen so many robots in my life. There are like four Robbie the Robots and about half a dozen R2D2s right here. That was pretty cool. Uh, and that's a two-day event where all the makers get to show off what, what they make. And it's about sound, light, fire, electronics, food, and locomotion. Everything from farming and robotics to clothing and hot rods. And there are workshops, demonstrations, speakers, booths, and live performances. It's designed to share your work your processes, your ideas, your obsessions, your creations, and late night garage tinkering. It is serious engineering, but it's also punk rock. It's about innovative stuff. It's family friendly, it's whimsical. It's about showing off what, for us, will be Boiseans and Idahoans' unique attribute, ingenuity. One of the few things that is not so well known outside of the Boise area is that Boise, Idaho, has the highest per capita number of innovative and creative people than any American city in the U.S. And just about any way you cut it, this particular gentleman, who I'm going to introduce in a bit, will be able to testify to it if you've actually read any of uh, Richard Florida's work on the creative class. Actually, Boise Idaho is mentioned by name as one of the ones that has the highest number of per capita patent holders in the U.S. And if you're interested in finding out what, what we're going to be doing here in May 2013. We actually have a website. It's called BoiseMakerFair.com, fair, F-A-I-R-E. And you get into, you need to get in as a maker. To get into Maker Fair, there is an application process because not everybody is actually going to be able to make it. We're going to have a fairly high standard for makers uh, because although everybody's maker, not everybody's on par with each other and we really want to create this as a venue for innovators. Uh, this is not really so much art in the park, although that can be fun. This is more uh, science fair meets Burning Man. That's really kind of the theme, and that's the, the focus for almost all the maker fairs. And it's really something that I think we're going to be able to get an outstanding way in Boise. And uh, some of the things that we're going to be asking for those of you that want to fill out an application and really want to be makers, things that we ask ourselves as evaluators is, will the project that you're proposing be completed on time? Uh, does the project go outside the bounds of expectations? And so if you're a knitter, we want to show off a skill set that's more than just, say, the next meat scarf. Yeah. We want to see if you can take knitting to the next level. And. Um, and we're going to have a huge emphasis. You'll be able to sell some of your wares, but there is a large emphasis on sharing what you do through a barter economy and connecting with the community as both innovators and entrepreneurs. Now, what is a, what is a fair, if you think about it? It's 
especially the FAI R, R not the bus fare R. But it's really things that were put together in rural areas to, to special events that had a certain kind of circus quality to them. Uh, but really what were the folks in the rural areas trying to do but to create the densities that you would find in a city. And so they had a temporary way of making a city. It was a fair. Well, we actually live in a pretty innovative city right now. So this is one of our opportunities to capitalize on an existing resource that really hasn't been tapped into yet. And I'm going to give you a quote. This is from Seth Grody, or Grody. He's an American entrepreneur. He's an author and he's a public speaker. Better public speaker than me. But he said, cities work because they create collisions. Collisions between and amongst diverse individuals. Ideas go to cities to be born and to be spread. And the chaos that bubbles just underneath the surface feeds those ideas. If you want to find creative work, go to a city. If you want to find inspiration, expose yourself to diversity, not uh, you want to go to a city. If you want to find inspiration, um, you go to a city, you don't go into a tiny bubble. So, um, so truly, cities exist in this particular way despite the government of states and of nations. Ingenuity exists despite rules and factories and governments. Boise embodies this notion. Now, surprisingly, maybe not so surprisingly, uh, next year, uh, in 2013, the city of Boise is celebrating its 150th anniversary. And we've been actually working with the city of Boise to develop kind of a partnership between Maker Fair, uh, which will still stand as, a, as its own independent and individual effort, but to join with and capitalize on the synergy that we can create with the city of Boise's sesquicentennial uh, 150th anniversary events. And in the spirit of Boise being such a great city, we wanted to add this spirit with our own Maker Faire. And doing that means sharing and growing the Maker Spirit. Growing the Maker Spirit requires sharing knowledge. For this meetup, we brought an expert on these ideas. Now, this is Mr. Brad Fraser. He's a, a partner with Holly and Prossel. Now, many of us agree that a common desire of makers is to barter and, and participate in the gifting economy. Other makers want to invent something and hit it rich. Regardless of what side of the camp you're on, knowledge is power. No other maker fair has yet addressed the issues of what to do with your intellectual power, the property that you're generating, the ideas you come up with, and the process that you develop. We want to change that. It's time to shake off assumptions about what your options really are, and maybe even make new options for makers like us. So we brought in the maker-minded intellectual property lawyer, Brad Fraser. And Brad is a partner with the Boise law firm, Holly Troxell, where he practices intellectual property law. He's a blogger, he's a novelist, and a supporter of the maker community. Brad's here today to start off our education about trademarks, patents, copyrights, and the use of Creative Commons. Uh, you should know that these are what all these are, and you should know how they all work. Some makers never share their processes for fear of someone stealing them. And other makers want credit for their work so bad, they lock everyone out with too much protection, and their ideas never make it out into the world. Some companies buy ideas to make big money or squash competition. We want you to stop worrying about sharing your ideas, and we want you to get the credit for your ideas. And we want to make, and we want you to make your own educated decisions about how to do that best. So everybody, without further delay, Mr. Brad Fraser. Thank you. Thank you. Dean. That was a great introduction. Thank you. Very insightful. I agree with a lot of those comments because as makers, you each create something creative, presumably tangible. At some point, your idea is, is embodied in something tangible, whether it be a silk screen print or sculpture or a jar of pickles or computer code or whatever your particular thing is as a capital M maker. You reduce it at some point to a, a tangible form. 
So, you know, you, as Dean pointed out, you could simply decide to contribute it to the public good and, and give it away and place it into the public domain. And, or you could, because it's a tangible thing, you could protect it using traditional concepts of protection. You could put a lock on it, a physical lock. You could, you could hire a guard to protect it. You could put it in a warehouse and lock the door. You could do physical things to protect this tangible embodiment of your maker creativity. You could do that. But what we're going to talk about today are incorporeal intellectual constructs, intellectual property. So the things that you make exist as what we what, what call personal property. So in, in law school, we learned of three different kinds of property. Real property, dirt. Personal property, things that move around, like cars and shoes and sculptures. And then the third kind, incorporeal, or that which does not have a body, intellectual property. These are all intellectual constructs. And so as you make, you, you may find that you want to protect the things that you make with traditional modalities of protection. You may want to keep them in locked places. You may want to secure them in some fashion, the, the tangible embodiment. But what about the intellectual constructs? What about the ideas? What if, what if the way that you've invented a better way to sculpt clay, a better way to silk screen prints, a better way to write code, a better way to compose music or, or weave cloth or whatever your particular maker talent is? What about those intellectual constructs that someone could see and simply appropriate and use. Now, as Dean pointed out, you may not care. You may say, the maker community is all open source, share and share alike, and that's terrific. That's great. But I think it's important to at least know that there are more ways that you can protect the intellectual stuff that you create as well. And in fact, perhaps even more importantly, you can actually make money by protecting and then monetizing the things that you make as contrasted with the open source concept of just giving it away, which you can do. But if you actually want to make money, and just because I come from the private sector, I'm a lawyer, I represent people who want to make money from what they do. That, those are my clients, right? So typically, so this presentation today will come from the perspective of you want to protect what you make and you want to be able to make money from it. There you go. And if your view is different than that, that's okay, certainly. We'll still, I think, counsel together and talk about these different concepts constructs and you can decide what you want to do with them as Dean pointed out. So you know remember we spoke about real property and we spoke about personal property. These are the general kinds of intellectual property. And you maybe have heard of some of these terms before, just sort of anecdotally, but these are the things that protect the incorporeal aspects of what you make. We have patents and trademarks. We have copyrights and trade secrets, and lastly, we have intellectual property created by contract. And we'll talk about each of these in not great, great detail, because we don't have time today, but we'll at least give you an idea, idea of what each of them is and what they do, and how you can decide if you want to use them to protect what you make. Each do a different thing. A, a hammer is not a screwdriver, is not a cement mixer, is not sandpaper. They all are different tools, right? But you might use them all to build a home. Similarly, if you are to build something or make something, you can use all of these to fully protect the intellectual property and the thing that you create, which will give you the ability to more fully protect and monetize the thing that you make, if you choose to do so. And to have a remedy if someone were to steal it. So let me ask this general question. Think of the thing that you make. Anybody willing to tell me what they make, capital M make, in this context? Anybody? Certainly. Well, we know that somebody was doing silk screen prints. So you, and your, I'm sorry, your name is Julia. Julia. All right. So you make T-shirts and silk screen prints, right? Would you? How, would maybe the answer is no. But let's ask. Would you be aggrieved if your body of art that you created a silk screen on was simply so you woke up one morning and found it on somebody's website and they were using it without your permission, without attribution, without any sort of acknowledgement of your creativity? Would that bother you? Yeah. Okay. You mean the, the image? Yeah. 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 The actual art that you create. Yes, yeah. You'd be bothered by that. Yeah. So what I tell clients, I ask, this is the, sort of the question, the, the gating question is this. Would you be aggrieved if someone stole or appropriated or used your stuff, your creative stuff, without your permission? If the answer is no, okay. And then you'll probably be bored to tears by this presentation. Because the concept here is we want to protect what you've created. Great. 
But if you would be aggrieved in some fashion, as Julianne would be, to see all of your creative content stolen, misappropriated, used by some third party, all, you're essentially free research, free research and development for some interloper. Some guy who has a website, he sees your website, he goes in, you, you, all, you all are familiar with operating system software. What happens when you put your mouse cursor on a picture using Internet Explorer or, or a, a Mozilla, and you right click on it, what are your options? Copy, save as, right? How hard is it to steal someone's intellectual property on the internet? It's not hard at all. You simply right click, save as, and it's done. So all of the designs you've placed on the internet are simply stolen, just like that. Right click, save as. Would you be aggrieved? There you go. Some of the rest of you might be aggrieved if that happens. Some of you may not be. My position is that you should be aggrieved because you've worked hard to create this intellectual property. And for people simply to steal it without any sort of credit or attribution or acknowledgement or consideration for your hard work is wrong. It's immoral, it's unethical, it's illegal, it's wrong. And in fact, just as an anecdote, I'm not your dad, but when you right click save as, that's copyright infringement. That's actually illegal. That's a federal crime, a federal wrong that you're committing. When you go to the internet, see an image or something that you like, right click save as, that's copyright infringement. There you go. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So here are the kind of broad families of intellectual property, patents, trademarks, domain names, copyrights, trade secrets, and lastly, IP created by contracts. Let's go through each one. What is a patent? Now remember, they're all different things, and because I'm so passionate about this, I get irritated when people use the terminology incorrectly. When people say, I want to patent the title of my book, it drives me crazy. It doesn't work that way. When people say, I want to trademark my movie, it doesn't work that way. Those are all those are wrong usages of the terms. So I'm very fussy about how we use these terms. So let's define what everything is here. So here's the definition of what a patent is. The textbook definition is it's, it's a lawful monopoly given to the person who gets the patent to practice the patented thing for a period of 20 years from the date you file the patent application. That's all it is. So what that means, Dean, is that if you invent a better mousetrap and you get a patent on it, you then may take that issued United States patent and stop others from making, using, or selling a mousetrap that infringes on <coughs> Dean's patent. That's all it is. When Dean gets that patent on his mousetrap, people don't just start sending him checks. They don't start stopping doing it. Dean has to go out and find these folks. So uh, to be clear, what a patent really is, and I'm a little bit flippant when I say this, but what a patent really is, it's a, a license or permission for you to go sue people for patent infringement. <laughs> That's really all it is. And if anybody's ever told you more than that, you've got to get a patent, you've got to get a patent. That's just simply wrong. A patent permits you to go sue people for patent infringement, and that's all it does. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So what happens that. in the time between when you apply and it's granted? We'll talk about that. Nothing, actually, nothing happens. That's a very good question, and the answer is nothing. And I'll be very specific about that in a moment, OK? Now, there are three kinds of patents. There are utility patents, design patents, plant patents, and there's a separate thing for seeds called the Plant Variety Protection Act. Utility patents protect the mousetrap, the mousetrap, the invention, the utility, the invention, right? Design patents protect ornamental, non-functional features of a product. Very different. And a plant patent protects, well, plants. So today we'll talk mostly about utility patents and design patents, and, and hopefully we'll have a more thorough understanding of what they are. Believe me when I say to you, you can get a patent on anything. You may get a patent on anything. Here is a patent. This is the one that everybody uses in all of their presentations around the country on silly patents. This is a guy who got a patent for a method of combing over one's hair to cover a bald spot. It's an issued United States patent. And see, what makes this patentable is that if you read through the patent, it's not just the standard swoop over. That, that's not patentable. He's got a trifold patent thing going on. He's got swoop, 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 threefold. See, that's, that made it patentable, and he was able to get a patent on this. So yeah, you can get a patent on anything, but the question where I like to focus my clients is, so what? What are you gonna do with that patent? That's the question you should be asking yourselves if you ever ask, this should, if you ever start to think, I need a patent on this. The real question is, what am I gonna do with that patent? But you can get a patent on anything. Patents are, patents are just silly. I mean, you can get a patent on anything. As long as it's, here's the standard, new, useful, and non-obvious. And if you can prove to an examining attorney in the patent office in Washington, D.C. that your thing is new, useful, and non-obvious, you can get a patent. They'll send you a piece of paper that looks like this, 
that gives you a patent. But again, so what? Here we go. To your point, sir, what happens between the time you file a patent application and the time the patent issues? Nothing. Other than you're out $15,000, yes, that's what it costs, between eight and $15,000 to file a patent application, and three years of your time, you wait. And during that period of time, your invention is patent pending. What does patent pending mean? Does anybody know? It means nothing. It means copy it quick because there's no protection 